All right, AP students, I'm back. I know that I didn't give you a lot of uh, details uh, last week. I just gave you the one assignment, but that assignment's normally something I would have chunked into several smaller assignments. So um, I just gave it to you as one big project for you to read a modest proposal and deconstruct it. Uh, and you use those that Google slide uh, template. Um, you're gonna now take that, uh, what you did on your template, and you're gonna turn that into a rhetorical analysis. This is practice for the AP which is coming up in 16 days. So uh, we're gonna try to make this one look as much like an AP exam question as possible, even though uh, normally you wouldn't have, you'd have the reading time and the writing time all at once, which we'll do one more practice with that as well. But um, here's what I want you to do is you're gonna go to Utah Compose. Um, when you get to Utah Compose, you're gonna have to log in. So go there, I'm already logged in. I'm logged in as a student, uh, and you're going to go to practice up here, and that's going to show you a new prompt that I have, and it says this is a prompt that was actually used on a previous AP exam about a modest proposal, but it says, okay, the suggested time is 40 minutes. This question counts, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, starting right here, it says, um, Jonathan Swift satirical author most commonly known for Gulliver's Travels published a modest proposal in poverty-stricken Ireland in 1729. Read the proposal carefully, which you've already done. Then, in a well-developed essay, analyze the rhetorical strategy Swift uses to sway his audience. Support your analysis with specific references to the text. Okay, so then you're gonna click here. I put, the, I put it right here as well, the text, if you need it. But you're gonna click Begin Writing. And... Uh, when you start writing, you're going to see a timer goes, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. But you title the essay here, you start writing it right there. Now, hopefully you already have an idea of what to write because you should have outlined that on your um, uh, the Google Slides presentation. So you can have two windows open. You can have your slide, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> your, slide, uh, your slides that you turned in for this week can be open in one window and you can look at that and then come back over here and write. So basically that deconstruction uh, presentation was your pre-writing. That was you reading and deconstructing it and getting an essay ready to go. Now you're actually just gonna write the essay. Okay, I'm gonna close out that window. Um, you're gonna complete the essay titled A Modest Proposal Rhetorical Analysis. Once complete, leave a comment in the text box on Canvas on this assignment that says the following, I have completed the rhetorical analysis for a modest proposal. And when you do that on Canvas, that gives me the cue to go and check on Utah Compose uh, your essay. You don't have to copy and paste it. You don't have to format it in MLA format and turn it back in. I just want you to write it on Utah Compose and then tell me when you're done and I'll go look at it on Utah Compose. That being said, um, there's a few keys that I want you to focus on for this essay after looking at the, the recent writing that you've done. There's a few things that I think are going to help everybody improve their writing a little bit. So I'm going to give you a little presentation on that right now. So this is, uh, and I'm going to put this on your assignment as well so you can access this before you start writing if you'd like to. But it is a modest proposal rhetorical analysis keys to success. So first, a strong introduction and conclusion. What I'm seeing in a lot of essays, and it's not everybody, but it's in quite enough that I felt like I need to address it with everybody. Um, your introductions and your conclusions seem like afterthoughts. It seems like uh, you don't think that these are that important. And so you're just going to write a two sentence intro and then write all your body paragraphs and then like a two sentence conclusion. And it's like uh, such a shock to the system for the audience where we don't really know what you're talking about without a well-developed introduction. And we can't remember what you said without a well-developed conclusion. Remember, intros and conclusions work together to bookend the main ideas of your essay. So the introduction will explain the points that you're going to make. You're setting up what you're about to say, and then you say it, and then the conclusions summarize and restate the points that they made. So your intro and your conclusion are the first and last things that the readers uh, will encounter in your essay. And guess what is the most memorable for readers? The first thing they read and the last thing they read. Okay, now I'm not saying that those middle paragraphs aren't important because that's where the meat of the essay is. But let's say that somebody read your essay and somebody else asked them about it. The intro and the conclusion are what they're going to remember to say, oh, it's about this. And then they'll say it. And then that other person would need to read the body paragraphs to get more information. So intros and conclusions are probably the most important paragraphs um, 
because it's the first and last thing that your audience sees. So those should not be treated as afterthoughts or asides or something that, oh, I better do this just to do it. Make sure that you put thought into them and make sure they exist in the final product. And what I mean by that is sometimes students run out of time in the, in the actual exam. You only have 40 minutes to write the essay and um, they'll just write until time runs out and they'll, they won't have a conclusion and they won't have a very well-developed introduction. I, I'd say make sure that you plan your time so that if you see that you're running out of time and you're still like writing a body paragraph, you finish the body paragraph and you go into a conclusion instead of another body paragraph so that you have an intro, a body, and a conclusion and that everything's connected together. That's going to matter more than having a well-written body paragraph that doesn't have a conclusion to the rest of the essay and it's hard to see if they're connected. Okay, so that's the first thing. Make sure you have a well-developed introduction and conclusion to go with your body paragraphs. Okay, the next key to success, whoops, are well-organized paragraphs. Now, obviously, that's this seems like it's uh, elementary stuff, right? The keys to writing are good writing. But make sure the order in which your paragraphs, uh, you write your paragraphs, make the most amount of sense. But then also, it's like a it's like a balancing act right here. Know ahead of time what you what you will cut if time becomes an issue. So if you're trying to build up to your strongest point, so you put your weakest argument first, and then you build up to your strongest. Well, if you run out of time and you don't have time to write your third body paragraph, that's your strongest paragraph, and now you don't have the strongest thing in your essay. So look at your time and know, okay, I can't spend so much time on these paragraphs because I want to get to this one, or hey, you know what? I'm actually going to cut this first paragraph. I'm going to start with my second one, and we're just going to go uh, with those two. You can also use the sandwich method where you start with your second strongest body paragraph, your weakest one goes in the middle and your strongest one goes at the end. And that way, after your first body paragraph, if you realize you're going to be short on time, you cut that middle one out. And so you're just actually cutting the weakest of your three. And then you're talking about that um, that strongest one before you go to your conclusion. Um, the key to that is making sure that you write a quick outline ahead of time. I know that a lot of you want to just jump in and start writing and you, and you tell yourselves that's the way that you write best. That's the way that you've always written. But in order to improve your writing, you need to be organized ahead of time. That's what sets apart a good uh, middle school and high school writer from an advanced college writer, which the AP does expect you to write at the college level. So having a well thought out organization uh, matters. Okay. Make sure that in your body paragraphs, you're also writing about the best rhetorical strategies. That's what the, the prompt asks you to do. If you choose to write about ethos, logos, and pathos, don't just say that the author uses ethos, logos, and pathos. Of course, the author uses those things. Those are always those always exist in some form or the other in everything that's ever written. That's like saying the author uses words to get his point across. You can talk about the impact of ethos, logos, or pathos. But you must explain which rhetorical devices the author utilizes in order to create the specific ethos, logos, or pathos to which you are referring. So if you say, you know, in the middle part of Amano's proposal, uh, Swift utilizes pathos, well, how? Swift uses figurative language to create the image of starving children being turned into food to establish a pathetic appeal to the audience, something like that. Like you talk about the rhetorical devices that establish pathos or that establish ethos or logos. Okay. The same goes with other general devices that we've talked about. And this is something that had we still been meeting face to face, we would have really hit hard this quarter. But when you talk about things like mood, style, syntax, or diction, those things always exist all the time. There is a mood in everything that is written. There is style in everything that is written. There is syntax or, and diction in everything that is written. So just saying that the author uses mood is not an effective rhetorical device. What specific mood does the author use and how did the author create that mood? That's valuable. So you, um, uh, hopefully you un all understood that this piece was satirical, that um, Swift was actually criticizing uh, the elites of his time period and how, uh, how politicians or the government was handling uh, poverty and things like that. But um, you could talk about his sarcastic tone or something like that, and then use specific examples from the piece to identify that, okay? Make sure you explain how the author develops those things. Don't just use general terms. 
without explaining it because then to the AP graders and, and more importantly, just to your, your audience, it, it shows that you don't really know what you're talking about. You're just throwing out terms that you've heard in class and you actually need to be able to explain them in detail. Okay, the next key to success on this are strong transition statements. And if I was actually numbering these by priority, I kind of try to go in order. But if I was numbering these by priority, this would be the number one thing that I would like everybody to improve on. Paragraphs should not exist in isolation, okay? Um, a lot of you are writing really strong paragraphs, but there's no connection between the first body paragraph, the second body paragraph, and the third body paragraph. I'm seeing some attempts at transitions, but often they are sequential, first, next, then last. But when you're doing a rhetorical analysis, we're not really writing in a sequence. We're writing in uh, like our ideas. So I need to see how these ideas connect to each other and how they connect to your thesis. So everything is connected, but you must make the connection obvious through transition statements. Your readers do not think the same way that you do. So you need to explain the way you're thinking through these transition statements. So lead the reader from one idea to the next. Determine the relationship between the ideas. Almost never is, that's a weird way to say that, but it's, it almost is never, uh, is the relationship sequential in a rhetorical analysis. So simple transitions like first, next, then, after that, and finally are not great transitions for this type of writing. Okay, it says use this as a resource to help you develop your transitions. And I'm going to have a link right there and here, I'll actually, I'll take it out of uh, my presentation mode. You can see the next one that we're going to look at. Um, I'm going to take you to transition words and phrases for college essays. I've got a resource. Um, it's from the Writing Center at the University of North Carolina. And they do a pretty good job of explaining the purpose of transitions and why they're important. And down here, they have this little chart. They talk about types of transitions, how transitions work, et cetera, and expressions. Okay, you need to identify the logical relationship. So if what you write about in your first paragraph and what you write about in your second paragraph are similar, here are some phrases you can use. If they're different, you use this. Sequence, I already talked about that. Time, example, if you're emphasizing something. Anyway, determine the relationship between what you're talking about and then use some of these phrases, but don't use them by themselves. Blend your ideas together. Just as Swift utilizes situational irony throughout his entire essay, the satire becomes evident through these examples. That's a transition to go from talking about situational irony to talking about satire, and then you talk about your examples, and then you're just writing about satire right there. All right, back to this. So strong transition statements, not just words, statements. Okay, so I'll have that link uh, right there. Actually, let's do it. You guys can watch me do it so that you know that I did it. I'm going to copy that link, and I'm going to link it right here. I'm going to insert a link. There it is. Okay. Um, so that's another key feature. Then next, sophisticated language. A lot of you, when you self-graded, you gave yourself zero points for sophisticated language. I think a few of you are holding yourself to a, an incredibly high standard for what it means to be sophisticated. Some of us don't think of ourselves as sophisticated because we read something like a modest proposal and maybe we don't totally understand it. So we think we're not sophisticated. I think a lot of you are sophisticated and have the ability to be, but I don't think it comes as naturally to you. And that's why you think that it's hard. But all of you understand sophisticated language. I use sophisticated language with you. And even if you don't understand a word, most of you understand the main idea of what I'm saying. And so that tells me that you understand uh, sophistication. So sophisticated language does not mean that you must write like a college professor. Here are three keys to, um, and I don't like my formatting here. 
um, three keys to becoming a sophisticated writer. And as soon as I fix the formatting, I'll get back to that presentation mode. You guys can see this is me being precise right now. This is you seeing an example of somebody who pays attention to detail and wants things to look as professional as they can, even though me taking this break in the middle of the presentation isn't professional. Okay, so sophistication does not mean writing like a college professor. In order to improve your sophistication, you can do a few simple things very well and it'll make your writing more sophisticated. The first is avoid writing in the first person. Saying I think or I believe, what, get rid of that. Just make statements in the third person. If you must um, address a person, you can say people who read this or consumers of a modest proposal during this time period or readers or the audience or whoever, if you know that his audience were, were um, the politicians or or the the people whatever um use those terms and say a, a person who reads this will encounter in the second paragraph this or swift's audience would have understood this something like that okay also never write contractions in, in any kind of writing you do unless you're writing dialogue contractions are a verbal tool to help us speak more quickly but in academic writing, we do not want contractions. So words like don't, can't, doesn't, won't, et cetera, just write do not, cannot, does not, will not, whatever, okay? Possessives are okay. So you can have apostrophes in academic writing when it's a possessive word that needs an apostrophe S on it, but avoid contractions. Okay, so first key, avoid in the first writing in the first person. Second key, avoid contractions. Third key, use precise language. So instead of saying things like very nice, say words like pleasant. Instead of saying really good, say something like masterful. Now there's a million different words that you can use, but e even if you can't think of another word I'm, besides nice, get rid of very nice. What does that even mean? Very means extreme, nice is pretty middle of the pack. So that's a weird combination of words. Really good. Really good means great, right? So let's just say great. Okay, like I said, obviously those are just a couple of examples, but be mindful of better, more precise ways to say whatever it is that you're trying to say. All right, and lastly, I wanna talk about um, the construct of the essay. So when, as I showed you before, when you start, when you click on the Utah Compose thing, your timer will start right away. I want to give you an authentic experience of writing to see how much time you actually have. Like I said, you've already actually done the organization and now you have 40 minutes to write. It, when the test time comes, you'll have that amount of time to do both of those things. Actually, I actually think you have 45 minutes. So five minutes to read and organize your thoughts and then um, 40 minutes to write. Um, on Utah Compose, you cannot copy and paste. You must write the essay in Utah Compose. I disabled copy and paste from that. Um, because I know that some students would be tricky like I was in college and you'd write your essay on Google Docs and then you'd go and start your timer, let the timer run down and then paste your full essay in there and it made it look like you wrote this great essay in that amount of time even though you did it outside of uh, the tool. So you have to do the writing in Utah Compose. Okay, use the outline you already created to help you write well. Like I said, you can have two windows open. You can have your Google Slides uh, outline and the Utah Compose open on a different window, and you can go back and forth there. Okay, you should aim for a 25 on your first attempt. Okay, on a C, you write the best you can on your first attempt. Now, if you do fall short, I have opened up the revisions to as many as you want, okay? You can edit and revise your essay up to 99 times. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take whatever score you get, and I'm gonna double it, and that's gonna be your score out of 50. So a 25 would be a perfect score. Above a 25 gets you extra credit. However many below a 25, double it. That's how many you get out of 50. So if you get a 20, you now got a 40 out of 50. If you get an 18, you got a 36 out of 50. All right. Um, something I noticed um, from your last Utah Compose, uh, some of you are writing well, but you're just not writing enough. So just so that you know, quantity does matter. With them giving you about an hour to write, they are expecting a full essay that is so that... Uh, this is a little formulaic, but um, if if you write well, but you don't write enough, your score won't be very high. 
And if you write a lot, but you don't write very well, your score won't be very high. What you need to do is write an appropriate amount in 40 minutes. You need to write the appropriate amount and write it well. Now, a good rule of thumb is five well-developed paragraphs, an introduction, three body paragraphs, and a well-developed conclusion. They expect you to be able to do all of that in the time allotted. So you need to have well-developed, and that's just a fancy way of me saying you need to write full paragraphs, okay? I'm not going to give you a sentence number because I don't know what it is, but, uh, you know, if you're only writing, you know, a few short paragraphs, it doesn't matter how well you're writing, how well those are written. That's just not enough uh, for it to be a highly scored essay. Okay, when you are finished, make sure you follow the directions on Canvas and write that little statement in the text box so that I can go and check uh, your score on Utah Compose. If you are not getting to a 25 and you have no idea why, feel free to contact me and we can do a Google Meet. We can go over your essay together. I can maybe help you with some edits and we can try to see uh, what happens with your score on that. Okay, those are the keys to success on this essay. Good luck, and I look forward to reading what you write. See ya.